So if you don't know me, my name is David. I am uh, the site pastor here at New City and really excited about this new format we have for our midweek services. Um, this is our fir very first town hall meeting that we are hosting here. Um, and the purpose behind it, because sometimes people are like, well, shouldn't we be studying the Bible right now? And I'm like, that is, that is true. That's what we do here at, at the church. But, but the Bible tells us to seek the welfare of the city that we have been sent. Yeah. And it says that we are to, yeah, right? Yeah. And it says that we are to love our neighbors well, but I think that what we have come to know as we've been down here now for five years is that um, you can't love your neighbors unless you know who they are. And, and I think sometimes we as society today, we are so sheltered where we get in our cars from our garage and we go to work and then we pull right back into our garage um, and we never really get a chance to encounter or meet or know the people that we are called to love, that we're called to seek the wel welfare of as we are here. And so. That's why we're here today, because we've got a population of, what, about 14,000 students, about a mile and a half down the road, um, 14,000 students that exist in a bit of an island in our city um, where they kind of fly in, and then they do their thing, and a lot of them fly out. And, um, and so there, there are just some gaps in the way that we're able to communicate and love and care for these people, or at least even know some of the real needs that are facing people, students, uh, young people, adolescents, whatever, in, in the world today. And so because of that, because of our immediate audience just down the road, that is why we are bringing in the professionals to teach us today. We have got four uh, faculty and staff from the university. We've got, and I'm going to say it once, and then I've been told that we're just going to go by first names for the rest of the night, okay? So if you have questions, you can ask the, you can just go by first name. Uh, we've got Dr. Jennifer Konzadine. Kanzadine, yeah. who is the associate professor, department chairperson for communication studies. I just want to point out Dr. Jennifer, okay? So at any point, if you want to talk to her, you can say Dr. Jen, or no, you can just say Jen. Okay, Jennifer. Jennifer? We're so informal here. This is perfect. Uh, next up, we have Missy Burgess, who is the associate director for student involvement at the university. Thank you for being here. Uh, Dr. Art Munin, who is the associate vice chancellor of Student Affairs and the Dean of Students. <laughs> He's got a business card, right? That's what I'm saying. And then we have Lisa Mick, who is University Grounds and Maintenance, who is connected to a few people here and just really, really excited to have you all here. Um, and so as we get started, I just, I would love to know, um, I think we'd all love to know just a little bit more about, like maybe like a, a 90 second, who you are, what you do on campus, and, and you know, how long you've been here, what brought you here, okay? So Jennifer, we can start with you. I'm gonna use the mic. Yes, perfect. All right. Are we on? Oh yeah, we're, we're definitely on. All right, um, I, I'm Jennifer. I have been at UW Oshkosh now for 10 years. Um, I am just recently the department chair uh, of communication studies, um, but primarily I'm a professor. I teach, I love teaching. It is um, my absolute favorite thing to be in the classroom with students. Um, when I am not teaching, um, I also do some research. My research in particular is on how we talk about religion and spirituality in non-religious settings. So places like hospice or healthcare or nonprofits where we have to talk about those things. Um, and I really am focused on how do we be inclusive when we do that and how do we have difficult conversations. I grew up in the Midwest and this is a place where, you know, we're not supposed to talk about religion and politics. I think we should and I think we should do it better. And so that's really what I spend time researching. Very cool. Awesome. Very cool. All right, Missy. Awesome. My name is Missy Burgess. Um, I have been at UW Ashkash um, five years this week, actually. And so um, I work in reunion. Um, specifically, I supervise the staff in the student involvement area. So whereas Jennifer does magic inside the classroom, uh, my staff does the magic outside the classroom. So um, I work with the staff that do the programming board, student organizations, volunteer service, Greek life. Um, speaker series, diversity and inclusion programs, et cetera. Um, I live here in Oshkosh, um, and so when I'm not at work, I really enjoy being outside. I live right by Menominee Park, and so you might see me wandering through there almost every day. So, um, but I moved here from the University of North Dakota, and um, I'm originally from the St. Louis area. Very cool, And Thanks. just because Art's sitting next to me, go Cardinals. Oh, <laughs> 
she was setting me up. <laughs> it's going to get so much worse once I get through my intro. Uh, but uh, my name is Art Munin. Uh, I'm, uh, I don't know when I could stop calling myself new. I don't feel like I'm there yet. Uh, I've been here about two years. Uh, uh, my, you know, uh, my job has a lot of different parts to it. I supervise a few departments in student affairs. Uh, most people are familiar with the Dean of Students title, although they don't really know what that is. You know, it has this uh, uh, sort of negative connotation to it, uh, I think, in many people's minds. But my background's in counseling. The vast majority of the work I do is advocating for students who are struggling in some sort of way and help them find a way to be personally and academically successful. You know, that's really uh, what the goal of all that is. Um, and, and I absolutely love my job. I have, I have a, a great time doing it, uh, and I love being able to be with students in those moments of difficulty and see them go on to great success. Uh, I know I wouldn't be where I am today had not someone uh, been there for me along the way. Uh, I'm originally from Chicago. Uh, yeah, any Chicagoans? Really? All us, we have a small but mighty contingent up here. Uh, Sundays are quite lonely. Um, but first place. First place, first place. Um, <laughs> but uh, I live up near Appleton. Uh, my uh, wife, Heidi, is a uh, school librarian in the Kokona School District, and we have twin six-year-olds. Uh, so my, my standard joke is the dean of students' office can be a really, really uh, uh, you know, tough place to work sometimes, but it is always easier than the house I leave in the morning. Uh, I'm in charge of, the mor of getting the kids off to school in the morning, and anything in the office is easier after that. So. I am Lisa Mick. Uh, I am in charge of the grounds and automotive department. I am part of facilities. So um, with facilities, we take care of all the buildings. We take care of anything outside, I guess, is what, and the buildings and in interiors. So um, my, uh, my part with the students is I, I hire students. Um, I work with them. Um, Daniel is one of my students, was one of my students. Um, and I refer them as my kids because they do come to us as kids. I mean, they could be 20 years old and they're still the age of my son. So um, I don't know that we ever grow up. I hope you never grow up, Daniel. Yeah. <laughs> um, but um, I try to interact with the students as much as possible, uh, especially when they're working with me. Um, try to make it a, a, a place where they're comfortable. Um, and uh, where they feel loved, where I take care of them, I try to be that mom that they left behind, and um, and then try to reach out to the other students uh, with within campus, just being friendly, inclusive, like you know we've talked about. Um, try not to be the standoffish person. So um, I live in Fond du Lac. Um, I've got two boys, and one of them, my 19-year-old, actually goes to Oshkosh, uh, with the understanding that I don't communicate with him on campus. <laughs> so if I see him, I'm not allowed to call him out or anything. Um, it, right? It is very difficult, too. Um, but I'm happy to be here tonight, and Daniel, thank you for inviting me. Awesome. Can we just thank them for being here one more time? Yeah. And if you notice, uh, strategically on the screen, we've got names underneath in order of their presence, just so you know as you're thinking. This the little signs, they, they're, they're, really, they're really cute up front, but in the back you can't see them. So anyway, all right, let's just get right to it. Um, and at any point, there, we don't have to go in, in any order. If you have something to say, say it. If you don't, don't. Um, let's just get right to it. We're going to just ask some professional questions initially. So how have you as panelists, as faculty and staff at the university. How have you seen the university change over the past five to 10 years, or, or since you've been there, Art, okay? If anyone is, you can throw it out there. If no one has anything to say, we can move on to. What have you seen change? I've only been, I've, I got a big voice. I've only been um, with the university four years, so I haven't seen a lot of the changes as far as um, Within the students, I have seen, I, I deem more assaults and stuff like that on campus, which tells me there's a breakdown in, in, within the student society. Um, but um, I don't know that I've, I don't know how we help with that kind of thing, so. I still you look great. <laughs> I can't. I can't even tell you how much I love you right now. After, <laughs> after the budget cuts we've gone through and the staff we've lost, I can't even tell you how much I love you for that comment. We have left for 10 years and been back for three, and it just looks so nice. Thank you. It looks awesome. What do you think? Anybody? So uh, I've been here 10 years. It's weird I'm on a panel where I'm the one who's been here the longest. Um, but uh, 
I've been here 10 years, and I feel a little like 10 years ago, maybe I didn't know my students as well, but I feel like students were stressed out, really stressed out uh, 10 years ago, and I feel like they're really stressed out now, but I feel like they're a little more stressed out. So um, I feel like we have more students who are working not, not 18 or 20 hours a week, but 35 or 40 hours a week, and they're aware of how much student loan debt they're piling up. Um, and they're aware of um, the racism that is surrounding them, and they're aware of injustice in the community, and they're aware that we're in a world right now that's pretty divided and it's hard to talk about stuff. So I think it's, it seems to me like the stressors have sort of piled up on students um, in the last couple years. Um, and some of that's great, I think, because they're more aware of the world around them. But I also think sometimes it's harder, right? Because there's so much more social media and a little bit more, um, there's a lot more collect connection and simultaneously a lot more isolation that I see across the student body. Can I ask a, a, a leading question on that as well? Um, as you, the first thing you said, I hadn't really even thought about working more, um, burned out, working more because they have to. Um, do you see, are, are there, is there any correlation or cause to why they're working more? Are, is there, are student loans less available? Uh, are there less families able to help cover tuition costs? Do you have any supportive information on that at all? I don't have any data. Do any of you have any data? Or maybe you can. I, I think um, for me, I would also add part of it is um, the population that UW Oshkosh attracts um, and recognizing that 40% of our first year students are first generation still, um, which is a pretty astronomical number when you, you think. Can you explain what first generation means? So first generation means that they have not had, and there are lots of definitions. The one that I typically hear most often is no one in their family, parent um, or sibling wise has graduated yet from college. Okay. Primarily parents is um, where we think about it. But I think the costs of college are rising. Um, and so the ability for parents to help out, and um, parents may still be helping out in some cases, but the ability to cover all of that and um, those additional expenses, I think, are um, a, a big factor. But I think um, we, uh, one of the reasons I love working at UW Oshkosh, but we attract a very hardworking student body. Um, and so um, I would say that most of the student leaders that I work with, so now they're active and hold a position outside of class, hold at least two jobs. So how have you seen in the last 10 years then, ha how has tuition rates fluctuated over the past 10 years? Have they grown with, with cost of living? Have they grown with income? Or have they gone higher? I mean, tuition at UW Oshkosh has been frozen <laughs> for oh. the last couple of years, actually, right? Um, it, so tuition has been completely frozen. I think um, in, in terms of affordability, Oshkosh is actually a really affordable place to go to college when you compare it to other colleges. But, but as, as state funding has sort of decreased, college as a whole is not so affordable anymore. Sure. Right, and so I think even though even though our tuition has stayed the same, um, I also think there's sort of everything around tuition has gone up. Right, food is more expensive, cars are more expensive. It used to be that you could you know get away with not having a cell phone or a flip phone. I don't. I think it's hard to function without a cell plan these days. Right, so all that stuff around going to school has gotten to be more expensive. That makes sense. You know, another thing I'd put out there, and it's it's just an interesting point of reflection, I think, for folks in higher ed and outside, is what college students expect out of their universities and how that sets universities up in competition with one another. And so, you know, a department that I supervise that I love dearly, I'll pick on for a moment, and that's student recreation. I think, is it important to have student recreation services? Yes. Um, I think that some universities go over the top in providing the most amazingly beautiful recreation services that, uh, or buildings that you have ever seen anywhere and that you will never have again after you graduate too, by the way, right? <laughs> this is just for this time in life. Uh, but that is where your dollars went. You know, it went into that, you know, magnificent. It was on the, it was on the uh, front page of the Chronicle for Higher Education last year. Uh, LSU down in Louisiana put in a, um, uh, what's one of those? Oh, a lazy river that spells out LSU, like, all around. Like, did they need that? Like, was that, like, Hey, Art, 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 hold on, because we're, we're putting one of those in here oh, next gosh. year. So. Oh, Awkward, awkward. <laughs> Sketchy. What you meant to say is we need, we we need, need that. It'll be heated, yeah. though, so you can come this anytime. Is what, this is the editing we talked about. <laughs> um, 
But, you know, and, and this also goes for the type of residence halls students are asking for. You know, uh, if you come on our campus, we have, I, I supervise residence life, I'll pick on them too. We have amazing residence halls. We built a new residence hall. I don't know how old is Horizon. Uh, five years. Four or five years or so. Um, beautiful, sweet style residence halls that students say they want. We do assessments on students, though, about to figure out where they have the most enjoyment and where they make the strongest connections. They make the strongest connections in the old school residence halls with community bathrooms. That's where they have the strongest connections, the ones that are the cheapest to build and maintain. Uh, but, but I think a lot of higher education institutions get into this whole feeding frenzy of we bring students on campus for tours and how are they going to feel at looking at the facilities. And that really does affect the cost, substantively. Wow. All right, thank you. First, uh, that was really helpful. Second question, what are some, it'll be, I think we're gonna be talking a lot about some of the struggle tonight, the struggle that is very real, but what are some of the more incredible and beautiful things that you have seen happening on campus since you've been here? So the reason I do the job that I do and what keeps me coming back every day is um, when I get to see students learn and grow and develop. So when I can see students from the beginning of their freshman year until the end of their senior year and how far they've come, um, or in the, this, you know, the summer I um, pushed two students who I knew had a lot of potential but didn't necessarily realize it to attend a leadership program. They came back and they're like, you know, ready to take over the world with the passion and things that they have. So I think anytime for me, um, we work a lot with event planning. So to see students put a lot of work in, um, I will tell you that our spring concert is one of the hardest events for me that we do, but it is one that to watch our students put work in and to see the looks on their faces when they're successful, you know, when they can look out and see 4,000 people there, they're like, you know, I, I had a part of this. Um, and so those are the moments that for me, you know, um, well, that, that I look at and I'm like, you know, this is why we do what we do. Sure. Anybody else? You know, um, I, I had an experience today that uh, I had a student schedule a meeting to see me and uh, uh, we had, uh, as a pre-orientation program, this is the second year we did it, uh, we had this outdoor adventure program for students uh, that they could come for this four-day program uh, to go uh, camping, to go rock climbing at Devil's Lake, and, uh, and I went out and camped with them for one of the nights so I could hang out with the students, and uh, another excuse to bring my guitar out and uh, uh, hang whoa, out with whoa, people. Whoa, 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 do you go. see that we care about music here? It was well done. Come on down, well come done. on down. And, uh, um, and, and I had one of the students uh, schedule a meeting with me, and. Uh, um, you know, sometimes the conversations I'm having with students, uh, you know, are difficult, and it, it was uh, uh, just so meaningful for me that the student did have some difficulties, wanted to talk through, but also just wanted to ask my advice uh, about, you know, they've already changed their major, they're in their first semester, which I did three times, and uh, um, and just be able to talk out some of those life things and, and coming to me for some advice, and we just sat around my table and talked about music for 20 minutes. And it's just those little connections uh, of that community that just gets built over time that does, you know, keep rewarding you to come back. Yeah, I would add, uh, I had three encounters with alumni today. So 11.30, I had a student stop by my office so he could show me pictures of his one-year-old. He just happened to be on campus, right? Um, and I got an email from a student who had said to me straight up two years ago, when I said, you should go to grad school, he said, Dr. C, I have a 2.43 and I should not go to grad school. And I said, well, that's because you hadn't found the right major yet. But now you have, and your papers are brilliant, you should go to grad school. He's currently a teaching assistant at UW-Milwaukee uh, in their grad program. Right, I have another story of a student who um, gave his uh, legacy speech. In my program, we have students, seniors do a legacy speech. So all of our seniors have to go back to an intro class and give like a TED talk that is what I wish I would have known and how communication helps. So it's a really cool assignment. And I had a student do it a couple years ago um, and the next day after he gave it to a 200 level class, he came back to my class. He said, Dr. C, you won't believe what happened last night. And I said, well, what happened last night, Joe? And he said, I was at Quick Trip getting gas. And a student came up to me and said, I was going to drop out today, but your speech made me believe that I could do it. Um, and Joe had actually shown in his speech the email he got from the Dean of Students that said, you're going to be on probation and you, you can't be here. And then he showed his email back that was riddled with typos. Um, this is a student who is now uh, running a Wells Fargo uh, branch of a bank. He is the youngest manager in Wisconsin history at that branch of the bank, right? 
So I love those stories, right, of students who are like, I can't do this. And then they find the right place, and we say, yeah, you can. It might be hard, um, but you can get through this. And so I not only see faculty and staff encouraging other students, but I see students doing that for each other. And that is one of the coolest things I think we see is the community that gets built among students as well. Awesome. One thing I love that I just that we we all just heard was that you know we talk about beautiful things and it's not about this new space that was just built or it was about the people, and I think it's just so evident that you care about these students. So with that said, we've seen some beautiful things with relationships and with people. What are some of the harder things that you as professionals and I, and I know that like this is going to get out on on YouTube for seven people to watch in the future, and so. Um, <laughs> You can, you, can, <laughs> you can filter or not, but like, what are some of the harder things that you, have to, that you have to deal with in your jobs that just that we should be aware of? Um, I, so I had thought through some of this um, when looking at this question beforehand, but um, I think the one, by far one of the harder things for me is um, bias incidents on campus. And so um, incidents that are based on people's identity, so race, um, gender identity, sexual orientation, those sorts of things. Um, the things that uh, my core personal values um, and how do we help students that are, you know, sort of rip at those and how do you help students process um, and, um, and also yet create a learning environment for those students who may be the offenders also to, to learn in, in, in the space and how do you coexist and I'm not saying that very eloquently, but those are very challenging. Um, I think um, the other, and it's the moment when you realize the power of the community, but also the hardest thing that any of us in student affairs will ever have to deal with is we lost a student this summer um, in a car accident, and um, I saw some incredibly powerful bonds among students and their care for each other. Um, but I think any time that you have to help students process through those, that something that you feel like just shouldn't happen, um, and how do we, um, how do we sort of help students through that and then, you know, living on that legacy and that sort of thing. Um, I, I would just echo on that last, on that last sentiment. Um, I had a colleague many years ago um, who, like, made that as a point of reflection that there's no obituary section in the campus newspaper because it's not supposed to happen. And uh, um, I was just today, for that student who passed, we were planning a, um, she was, uh, she was going to graduate. And so we are posthumously awarding her degree. And uh, I just today had the registrar stop me that we got the printed certificates. Uh, I already have the frame. We're going to put it in. And uh, November, I think it's 2nd, uh, we're having um, a little ceremony for that family on campus. And, um, you know, uh, I'm usually the one that's calling the parents. And that's just, it's just, it, it was always awful. Um, I could say starting six years ago, it, it got awfuler. Uh, you know, once I started viewing it through the lens of a parent, uh, I just can't even begin to fathom. Um, so you do see those times to be able to have community draw around. Um, you know, uh, uh, I, I think anytime you work with any, any community, it's going to be uh, individuals you work with, it's going to be students, there's going to be loss. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I really do find and I've appreciated for these two years, uh, it has been a community that has drawn together and I've seen that repeatedly. Of a student passing, how frequent? You know, I, 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 you know, throughout my career, um, you know, you could have a year and it wouldn't happen, uh, and then you could have a year where there'd be a handful, several. Uh, it's really no rhyme or reason uh, to it. Um, yeah. For me and students that I specifically work with, and um, like th these were two that were very that like specifically worked in my area and, and that sort of thing over the course of my career. So I don't think it's often, but it doesn't make it um, any easier when it, um, when it happens. I, we were, um, another staff member and I met with the, the, um, the young woman's friends at one in the morning the night that we found out. And, you know, there's nothing that, um, you know, you get to know students very quickly and very personally. We walked in the house and we had brought in some water and some snacks and just to be a comfort, and the student said, um, all we have is our beer pong table <laughs> um, to put the stuff on, and I was like, okay, you could have just said set them on the table, um, and I, um, I wouldn't have known, but I, I think there's those very raw, 
raw and human moments um, that we, um, that we, when you experience that with a student and helping them through that. Um, I've, I've, like I said, I've only been here four years and, and with being with facilities, uh, we're the ones that have to clean up the graffiti um, out on campus and, and it was very hard the first time um, I think it was last year in the buildings when there was um, the racially um, derogatory uh, comments painted on walls and, and, and stuff like that. And, and to have to go in and clean that up and know that there's that much, you can't even say dislike. I mean, because dislike you wouldn't go to that extent. To, to know that somebody is just carrying that much anger within them and, and hate towards one race was... Um, was a little, was a tough moment for me because I just, you, you live in a world, you live in your own world where you know what you know and, and you try to give that to other people and then when you realize that other people aren't like that, it's, it was just, that was difficult for me and we've, we've had to clean up some other stuff and it's just, it's always a shock to me to find out that that exists, I guess. I'm in my own little bubble, so. Well, I guess that connects to our next kind of category, and that is student questions. And so in your field, in your, in your world on campus, what would you say are the top stresses that you see facing students today? I asked my students yesterday. They had plenty of answers. <laughs> um, it's, it's the beginning of week five, so the first thing they said was homework. Um, they are firmly convinced that all of us who teach classes get together in a basement and compare our syllabi and try to make weeks four, nine, and 14 the worst of their entire existence. <laughs> uh, we don't, it just happens that way. Uh, so, I mean, I think some of it is homework, but, but a lot of it is it's homework because it's balancing all of the other things that they're doing, right? right? So it's balancing homework and um, working jobs and a major and a minor and their friends and their families and all of the parental expectations that they walk through life with and all of those things. So, um, so I think, A, it's just workload, right? It's just so much to do. Um, I think, B, I spend a lot of time with students who go, I don't know what to do with my life. And I feel like I'm supposed to know because I have to declare a major at 18, no pressure or anything. Um, and so I, I really try to walk that back for students and like, it's, it's okay, you don't have to declare the rest of your life at 18, but I think we have a societal narrative that sort of says you do. Um, and so that, that puts a lot of pressure on students. And so I think that's another stressor that they really talk about. And then the other stressor that they talked about yesterday was, um, was simply money, right? Money is a, money is a huge stressor. Uh, for a lot of our students in figuring out how to balance that. And for many of them, there's enough money to make it till tomorrow, but if the car breaks down, there isn't enough money for that. Um, and so that's a constant stressor too. You know, yeah, I mean, all of that. Uh, uh, I, I just, I try and imagine back, uh, although it literally was a different century when I was in college. Um, you know, just all the, just, I mean, all the, all the incredible amount of energy that gets sucked out of students in so many different ways. I think uh, uh, they are really trying to balance it all, um, um, all while trying to maintain a sense of personal health and wellness, their academics, their family, intimate relationships, everything. Um, and I, it's more than people had to balance, you know, uh, you know, 20 some odd years ago when I was in it. And um, uh, so, I mean, I could definitely see that wear on many of them. Anybody else? No? Cool. Uh, again, this, the financial thing, it, it keeps coming back to me. I'm just curious. Like, so with the, the finances, do you think that there really isn't enough money? Or is it money poorly managed? Or is it there's just like, because I know when I was 19, like, it's not that I didn't have money. It's just that I spent it on really dumb stuff. And so is that still a common pattern? Or is there really like, it's just a different landscape. I mean, that was, again, a long time ago for me. I would say you're going to get the gamut. And, and I would say we have the gamut at this institution. You know, we have very affluent students at this institution, right, uh, who take out no financial aid and whose family is able to pay for their education. We have that uh, um, uh, as a segment of our population. And then we also have a segment of our students who utilize a food pantry that we run on campus in order to assist them with that. Um, you know, in my previous position in Chicago, um, some of the food, some of the uh, 
financial security uh, issues were so great that I had standing contracts with youth, local youth hostels so that I could get homeless students quick places to stay uh, when that came up. Um, I think that is something that is happening system-wide. Now, have I seen some students make some awful decisions with their money? Absolutely. Like, I'm going to take out a grand more in financial aid just so I can have a grand in my pocket. You know, uh, for a lot of these aid packages, you can just accept everything they give you, and no one's going to tell you you can't, even though it exceeds the need that you have, and it just becomes a tomorrow problem. Um, you know, I, uh, I've seen uh, students uh, use that money. Like, if you have to buy a car because you need it for X, Y, and Z, that's great. Do you need this car or that car, right? I mean, as far as you're budgeting that. Um, we do a lot of financial literacy work on campus. We try and educate students. Financial aid does a great job at that as well. Um, but again, uh, you know, we're a little younger in life. We're, you know, very easily being able to, I can sign this piece of paper and you're going to give me this and I don't have to pay you back until a, a year I can't even fathom at this point. Um, you know, I, I think that sometimes is easy. Uh, so I, I do think you see the gamut here at an institution like this. Very cool. I think that connects well to this next question of what are some of the more uh, tangible physical needs that you see facing students today? Things like food poverty, abuse, marginalization, lack of resources? I think food insecurity is real um, for a portion of our population. Um, there um, are students who, um, when they move into the residence halls and are required to have a meal plan are the first time that they've had food security. Um, there are students who, when they move out of the residence halls, then sort of experience a level of food insecurity. You know, when you have, when you host an event with food and you have students come through with to-go containers, um, you know, that there's a level of need there that probably exists. Um, I think um, transportation is another one. Um, it's pretty easy to exist at UW Oshkosh without a car, I would say, um, but it is not easy when you get to your junior and senior year and need an off-campus internship. Um, I think we have public transit in the city of Oshkosh and it's great, um, but the convenience of that transportation and um, and that, so I think for our students, and you know, cars are expensive, um, and gas, and maintaining them, and parking, and um, you know, the the balance of paying for a parking permit versus playing the parking lottery every day of whether or not you're going to get a ticket, um, and those sorts of again, edit that part out <laughs> <laughs> decisions um, that people make money-wise, but I think um, are all sort of um, very real kind of physical things. Um, I think the other thing is, and when we talk about changes over the last five years, um, Jennifer talked about stress, but um, access to mental health services, um, I think is, um, we see that very much an increasing need on campus, but it is, I think we are having more and more students who are coming to campus already with a diagnosis, and so how do you sort of exist in the, um, in the college world and have access to those services? I'd say for anybody in this room that um, doesn't know what you want to be when you grow up yet and you want to make the most amount of money possible, you should go into academic publishing because these book companies are making incredible amounts of money on college students. Uh, and just had a whole bunch of students start laughing. It's, it's absolutely absurd. Uh, it is absolutely absurd. And uh, I'm going to give you a revolutionary idea. I went to college at Eastern Illinois University, and they still have this today. It's called book rental, where you rent the books from the institution. I paid 60 bucks a semester. Again, this was the 90s, so we got to inflate it a little bit. But still, and I gave them the books at the end of, back at the end of the semester. It was a beautiful, beautiful thing. Uh, uh, and this is something we do try and educate faculty on for them to think about when they're selecting books. Do you actually need that new edition? Or can you still use the fifth edition because what changed with algebra anyway? You know, with, with so many of these. That and new math is interesting. Is though, it so. really? Okay. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm on six-year-old math right now, so that's all I'm up to. Um, but then also, many of these book publishers are becoming quite savvy, and instead of selling you books, they sell, they sell you an online code to the modules that expires at the end of the semester, so you can't even sell that to someone next semester. So either go into book publishing or go into teaching and become the professors that don't pick these books and, and pick these things. Yeah. <laughs> 
That's just me. That's I have no answer for you. <laughs> Dr. From, Jen. from the professor bias, we may have assigned more pages that didn't get read, but, but I agree with you, right? I 100% agree with you, right, that we shouldn't have you buy a really expensive book that costs you, right? Yeah. <laughs> yes would be the answer. I bet Author there's a whole year, underground. page number, you're good. A whole underground. So we used to photocopy pages, right? Now it's just screen cap on the iPad. And you can just like flip the page, screen capture it again, make your own. PD no, we can't edit that part out, Tommy. Okay. I will. Can I add one more? Yes, one more please. really Thank tangible you. thing. Change this subject. Uh, yeah. So uh, <laughs> I think one more tangible thing that I've heard more and more students talk about is is the housing that they're in. So not when they're on oh. campus, right? When they're on campus, I think it's. It's great. Um, when they move on campus, I think we have really, really great landlords in this town. Um, but from some of the stories I've heard from students, we have maybe some not so great landlords as well. Um, and I think it's a, it's a pretty vulnerable population of students who aren't real sure how to advocate for themselves in really difficult circumstances. So I've had students who are paying $600 a month for a heating bill, but their house is only up to like 62 because the windows are like half cracked, right? And they don't know how to do anything about that. Um, so I think that's something that, from my perspective, is a community issue that is something that we all need to talk about and engage in. So I know that there was, uh, there was, an, a, there was a proposal to have rental inspections in the city for landlords. Yeah. Now, when I was living in Minneapolis, like, we had really ridiculous rental guidelines. Like, there were inspections. And I know that I think it was, it was pushed away, but it was primarily directed towards campus housing, wasn't it? Yeah, I, I don't know where that went. I know that that was that came up in a lot of conversation two years ago, because uh, because it would be, uh, I think, transformative uh, and hold some folks accountable that perhaps need to. Uh, just as a, a note out there for folks, we have a student's attorney on campus that if you know of anybody with rental issues, they should it's their lawyer. Uh, they should come on campus in order to help to learn how to file the complaint, and you have to file complaints just every single time. That's. That's an incredible resource. That student attorney is five dollars also the, the per time that you see them. So in terms of cost, it, I mean, where else can you see an attorney for five dollars? So some of us should just go back to school, right? Yeah, it'd be cheaper. It'd actually. be cheaper. Yeah. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> no, not yet, but you just never know what's going to happen. Oh, he was man. just plagiarizing, like copying exactly. the books. So, so yeah, you know, gonna there's going to be. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we edited that part out. All right, this is, this is really awesome. Um, so we hear, I think, just in the news, we hear about some of the, lar the bigger problems that are facing, like the more, um, the more I, don't know, I, I don't know, just the bigger problems like we see, hear about, like UW Oshkosh has uh, a nickname. It's, you know, it's Sloshkosh, and we have like uh, binge drinking, addiction, assault, these are big problems, and if you have if you have perspectives on these, I'd love to hear it. Um, but I'd also love to know if there are some, I don't know, some other tensions kind of lying beneath the surface that that you see boiling over. Whether it's um, you said some things about just uh, uh, assaults and like safe spaces and politics is crazy right now and religion gets crazy sometimes and like so just curious like what are some other tensions. Do you have perspectives or, or thoughts on the, the problems that are really obvious, but also any that kind of might be underneath the surface? Uh, I would say that campus is um, very focused on diversity and inclusion efforts. So um, our chancellor has made it, has stated like this is what his legacy will be is sort of that improvement of that. But the reality is we are a primarily white institution in a primarily white city. Um, and so um, the, um, being welcoming to people of that may look different or um, may be different than me um, and how we can create that space. Um, I think it's also, you know, it's we talk about recruiting students, but it's also how do we retain them? So once they get to Oshkosh, how do we help them to feel a part of both campus and the community um, and have the access to the resources and things like that? You know, you mentioned uh, alcohol, so I'll try not to get too much on a soapbox for a minute. Um, but uh, just a show of hands, how many, how many folks are from Wisconsin? Are you from Wisconsin, the majority of people here? Okay, hands down. Who's not from Wisconsin? Got a couple of people? Okay. Um, 
just kind of curious if folks have a similar experience. I'm, again, from Chicago, not too far away. Uh, my reflection is drinking is different up here. Alcohol is different up here. And I'm seeing a lot of head nods around the room. I don't see those head nods at every crowd I speak to. But, um, you know, and I have the data to back it up. Uh, so I do think there is something cultural with this state that there's a permissiveness here uh, that does permeate our students that they have come to college and so, and so often people say, you know, they come to college, you know, and they, they start having these, uh, you know, alcohol issues. It didn't start here, right? Very few, like the majority of students who drank, drank before they ever got here. Um, so I do think there are significant issues. Now, I also think that there are stereotypes that have just continued to be passed down generation to generation. A couple weeks from now, there'll be uh, an event that occurs once a semester. Uh, and folks know what I'm going to talk about? Pub crawl. I have two days a year where I am a stereotypical dean of students, right? Where I'm out there making sure no one has any fun. And that's one of them. And uh, so we're doing ride-alongs with the cops. I mean, starting with, uh, starting early in the morning because we have students being transported to the hospital before noon for alcohol uh, uh, over intoxication, which is ridiculous before noon. And then I, uh, my staff usually does the ones during the day and then I do, I walk with the officers up and down Main Street. And, and they're writing tickets all night. And then they turn all the tickets into me, and then the students who get tickets also have conversations in the dean of students' office, okay? They write, on average, about 80 tickets for a single pub crawl. What percentage of those do you think are UW Oshkosh students? I'd say about close to 70%. 70%, anybody think higher or lower? Lower? Yeah, it's less than a quarter. Less than 25% of them are UW Oshkosh students. A lot of other people descend on this community and live it up for pub crawl, but the stereotype and the belief is if there's anybody 18 to 24 years old who's out drunk walking around, that means they're a UW Oshkosh student, and it is not the case with pub crawl. And so if you could help me, I, try, I share that statistic after every pub crawl, uh, just to try and help change the dialogue a little bit. Is it a significant issue? Yes, but it isn't just a UW slosh kosh issue. And I would say one of the related issues is, is the power of that narrative. Um, because I, I probably run into in the classroom more students who would like to go out and have a good time and not drink than students who really want to go out and drink. Mm -hmm. Um, but they're just not sure where or how to do that, right? Yeah. So I think we have groups like Party Point o who are trying to change that narrative, which is awesome, right? Oh. Yeah. So do, do you know that, Jake, this is his church? Oh, this cool. does not surprise me. <laughs> also, can you all come train my class into how to respond when I speak before class? This is awesome. Um, yeah. <laughs> Uh, but, but I do think that narrative is really hard for students and, and leads some students to feel really isolated and, and like uncool. Um, one of the things that we do in our major is really try to change that narrative um, among the group of students that we can access. But, uh, but I think there's a lot of power. There are more students on campus who don't drink than students who do. Um, but that narrative is really, really strong. To say I grew up in El Dorado and we had two bars across the street from each other and two churches and a population of about 500 so um, I, I agree I think there's a different um, attitude in Wisconsin um, as a mother of a 19 year old he just had his freshman year last year um, we have a good relationship so he talks to me and he had said I mean um, in our household alcohol has never been a taboo thing if I have a beer and he's 17 and he's home with me and I'm like, hey, do you want one? It's never been a taboo thing. So when he first came to me and said, oh my God, I was blacked out drunk the other day and that will never happen again. I was absolutely shocked because I thought, why? Why did you feel the need to do this? And, and it, was, it was this opportunity, as he put it. He's like, you know, mom, I'm, you're not there. You're not lording over me. You're not telling me what to do. And I just wanted to give it a shot. What's up, Daniel?
Yeah, I, I guess and the funny thing is now my kid's a sophomore, and I was asking him, I'm like, so, you know, partying a lot, and he's like, eh, got it out of my system. And, and a lot of my students that, are, that work for me and are juniors or seniors, you know, I'll be like, hey, you guys, pub crawl's coming up. They're like, yeah. I'm like, do you guys do anything for it? No, we just avoid the area. So it's interesting to me to hear, like, your stats on the 25%. Now I question, when I, when I talk to my students and they say to me, yeah, no, I just try to get the heck out of the area, I think to myself, well, if they're not the ones that are doing the drinking, then who are? So um, it's, I would love to share that stat if you'll let me. So sweet. All right, so question. With, uh, with students then, so they are leaving home. They are living on their own for the first time, most of them for the first time. Their, their, their authority figures are not there, except for uh, the big bad dean of students and <laughs> their professors. Um, so at, at what point are they, uh, are they in, like spoken in, future into? Like how, how do they become the people that they were made to be when they're, when they're in class? Um, and I know that you speak like you encourage, and I know that you mother Danny. Thank you for taking care of him. Um, nice. But but what other what other sources of input or even influence? Like, you know, so if if a kid goes and says, I, "College isn't for me. I want to be a plumber." Like they're mentored into this world of snake and drains, right? So at what point within a, a liberal arts education is there more? So in the church world, we use the word discipleship, right? So like mentoring, focusing in, let me show you how to live. Let me show you how to become a well-rounded human being. What type of resources are there available at the university or not? I think for a lot of these kids, um, it's their professors. I mean, I hear this all the time from students that have, it's that one professor that touches them, that, that um, reaches out to them um, when they're tired in class, what's going on? Why, why, are you, why are you sleeping through my class? And, and somebody finally notices that, hey, something's not quite right here. Um, I really do, I think, I mean, I'd love to give you all the credit, Art, for lording over them and stuff like that, but um, they're not as afraid of you as, no. okay, good. Um, but their professors, I mean, not that they're afraid of their professors, I, by no means, I mean, some of them just kind of laugh at them, but it's those, those rare ones on campus and people like Missy, I mean, I've heard a lot from, from students, um, the way you treat them and, and you reach out to them and you talk to them, as they're, as, not as, as children or, or anything like that, but as adults. You, you respect them already at that stage and you expect them to be at that stage. And so, um, I mean, they, they do want to be mothered. Um, they're in a whole new world and, and they've left all that behind and yet they're still, like I said, they're still kids. Um, but yeah, they want to, they want to have somebody acknowledge them that this is where I'm heading and this is who I'm becoming and they want the encouragement, um, to reach that point. So I think everybody needs to feel like they matter. Um, there's a student development theory, marginality and mattering, um, even that talks about how do we get students that connection. And I think my hope is that. Um, every student finds that connection to campus, but also every student finds that connection that helps them move on. So for some people, like, and you can tell by who the students go back to see when they come back as alumni. So they come back to see um, Jennifer, they come back and you know see their advisor for the programming board. They also go back to see the dining cashier that, um, mm -hmm. that swiped their card every day or made their coffee every day um, because somebody showed them that they mattered. Um, and I think sometimes it's also teaching them those life skills. Lisa can convince any student that doing shoveling snow at two in the morning is the coolest thing ever. <laughs> I, I don't know how it's possible, but literally they are so excited to work for her. And she also lets them drive cool toys and other things. But um, I think that it's, you know, and so it's hard to pinpoint who are those exact people. Um, but I, I think we hope that we create an environment where everybody finds you know, it's also there's our office manager, um, our reservations person and our office are two of the kindest humans ever. People that work for them come back to visit all the time um, because somebody again showed that they cared and also taught them about things like, hey, you should show up to work and probably on time, yeah. you know? <laughs> um, you yeah, should thanks. send an email if you're not going to be here. You are required to wear your uniform, you know, those sorts of expectations that again, teaching them about life. 
So in a, in a world that is as con like the most connected society in all human history with technology, are you finding that this generation is as disconnected relationally as I guess I guess that we, we assume to be? I mean, like we, we see people uh, walking with their friends, not talking, but texting each other, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, is this, is this a, a real thing that we're seeing? Like, where, where are we at? Jennifer can give you stats and other things. I think face-to-face -face communication is, is a struggle for many of our students um, because they've communicated via text or um, I mean, it's the, it's the roommate conflict that happens via Facebook with two roommates in the same room. You know, it's those sorts of things that I think are sometimes challenging, but I think I'm slowly seeing the generation of students that's coming in now saying, I'm gonna take a break from technology, or I'm gonna, you know, I need to step away, I need to, you know, draw some boundaries and that sort of thing, but I think face-to-face -face communication is, I, you know, I'll be honest, I don't like to call and order a pizza. You know, because I have to talk to a human. I want to be able to do it online, um, and so. Yes, from <laughs> <laughs> that's. Who who would rather use the internet to order pizza? Okay, good. Uh, no. All right. So, how important, uh, Doctor C? How important is connection? I think connection is massively important, right, for any of us. And I, I think our students can find it in multiple places, right? I mean, one of the hardest things for me on campus is to try to figure out, you know, is this a student that I need to connect with or do I need to connect them to somebody else? Or every once in a while there's that really difficult conversation where I needed to be the first one to say, you don't like it here, <laughs> right? Let's figure out how to make you like it here or let's give you permission to say I need a year off, right? Um, so I think connection is massively important, and some of you are 20 right now. It's been a little while since I've been 20. It's really hard to be 20, right? Your 20s are hard. Like, you don't have your family anymore, and I think particularly for students who are graduating, um, the college environment is a little bit of a bubble where there's always people who are doing the same things you are. So I think if, if there's another group that we really need to reach out to, it's those um, really recent alumni who for the first time are like, what am I doing next? Um, and, and are incredibly isolated. Um, so yeah, I mean, connection, connection is important, right? There's our interpersonal communication textbooks will say, right? Connection is health, right? Um, and, and isolation is not, um, but different people need that in different types of, types of ways. The only other two cents I'd put onto that is uh, college is a bubble, which is why many of us never left. Just don't leave college. If you just stay here forever, it's kind of awesome. Um, so that's, that's point number one. And point number two is uh, I, I do try and pump the brakes a little bit uh, sometimes on, on, the, on the critical thoughts I have as far as um, what I see in college students today because uh, I finally reached that age where I have the thoughts that, that just go along the lines of, well, this new generation is doing it wrong because my generation did it right. You know, I think every generation eventually crosses that threshold where we look at the younger ones and say, ah, well, they're doing it wrong. We don't know yet, right? Uh, uh, I can remember the awful things that were said about Gen X, right? And, and how we were never going to amount to anything and never be able to pull our slack ourselves together. Uh, a few of us managed to, you know, along the way. Um, so I, I do think our students struggling with connections in some ways, sure. Uh, I think they're also able to process much larger quantities of information than I ever was able to at that age because they've been trained to do it their entire lives. And that is going to serve them in, in a world that is going to require them to do that in increasingly more nuanced capacities. And I think uh, folks of older generations are going to struggle in that new world. And so I, I do think there are assets they bring as well. Awesome. Okay. So we... We have 21 minutes. This has gone so fast. Um, quickly, I'd love to, we'd love to hear some input on church questions, um, but also leave like a few minutes open for uh, questions. Um, so quickly, from your perspective, how important uh, to the student body is faith, religion, spirituality for students today? Um, so I am in no way the expert. I will say that I got these questions um, and then I was reading through them in my office and I walked to get a, a soda into our convenience store and I overheard a conversation yesterday and I was like, this is exactly what we're talking about. But um, I walked in and the beginning part of, I, I don't know what the beginning context was. So you walk in about halfway through the conversation and I hear one student say to the other, didn't you ever learn that in Sunday school? 
and, <laughs> the, the, when, and the student must have said, and I didn't go to church or it wasn't a part of, and the one student was like, well, my mom made me. Another student was like, well, my dad made me. Um, so I think that for, um, for a population of our students, it is, has been a part of their lives, but for some, it has been um, not always a choice yeah. to be a part of their lives. And so when you now come to college and you have choices, um, and I don't have to get out of bed on Sunday mornings or those sorts of things. Um, so I think um, students may come in with that sort of grounding in faith, but are trying to explore what that's like. Um, I think um, church for some has a stigma um, and for some it is the place that connects them there, you know, to, and grounds them and, and hugely a part of their lives. So um, how do we do and talk about faith without being uh, churchy? Um, and I think you um, talked about it as we were coming in, how do you create an environment that doesn't seem, that allows people to celebrate their faith, but without having some of those traditional stereotypes. You know, I, I'd say it's something I'm, I'm still maybe trying to um, figure out myself. Uh, most of my career has actually been in Catholic higher ed. This is uh, one of... Uh, uh, I haven't spent a lot of time in, in, in public higher education. I, I was at DePaul University for 11 years and Loyola Chicago for three before that. And uh, so in most of my work, uh, university ministry was a department that was at the table talking with us and uh, spirituality was infused you know, throughout the lifeblood of the institution. And I think I'm still trying to figure out how that does work here because I, because I do know how important it is to college students. I know that uh, surveys say students expect to grow spiritually through their time while they're in college. Wow. And, uh, and I also know, you know, that state institutions can get really wrapped up in this whole idea of freedom of religion, but there's that saying, you know, freedom of religion doesn't mean freedom from religion. Uh, you know, how do you still prov uh, provide a space for that without adopting it by the state? Um, so I can tell you, I mean, still as a relatively new person here, it's something that I'm trying to figure out. Yeah, I, I have the privilege of leading a group on campus called the Interfaith Dialogue and Education Alliance. So we're part of the Inclusive Excellence Council, and one of the things that we've done is, is try to bring questions of religion and spirituality into the conversation about inclusion. Um, because um, for, for some folks, faith is super important, right? A, into what they do, into their daily walk through campus. And, and for, other, for other folks, it's not at all important. Um, and, and faith means a whole wide variety of different things. We did a campus climate study a couple of years ago, um, and there were more than 30 34 different faith traditions represented on our campus. So I think one of the challenges for us is when we're trying to serve all students and we want to think about and provide spiritual care for our students, that means so many, many, many different things to all of our students, and that can be really hard to navigate sometimes. Um, I will say that, that the group I work with has, has worked to create spaces where we can do that on campus. So for example, there's now a room in Dempsey Hall, which is very centrally located on campus, that's called the Reflection Room. Um, and any time that Dempsey Hall is open, um, anyone can go in there um, and use that space as a time for quiet reflection. Um, two of my favorite things about that room, um, when I, I got to send out the campus email announcing that we were going to be able to open that space thanks to facilities donating it to us, which is pretty awesome. Um, and uh, a lot of groups work together to make that happen. Um, within about four hours, I had, um, I think it was 11 emails, and there were eight different faith traditions represented across those emails. So somebody would say, you know, I'm Christian and I really appreciate this space to pray. I'm Muslim and I really appreciate this space to pray. I'm an atheist, but I needed a space to meditate. Um, and so, so that's been really cool for me to see um, that happen. Um, my other favorite story about this space is um, when it first opened, I tried to go in there real regularly. Um, and there's a bookshelf in there. It's completely empty. Um, and so uh, the first week, a couple of copies of the Quran appeared on the bookshelf. And then the next week, there were three New Testaments right next to the Qurans. And then the week after that, there were some adult coloring books and colored pencils that appeared on the bookshelf. <laughs> Uh, and I just thought, you know, this is really cool, right? Like, for me, this is what college is about, right? Like, whoever you are, we want you to be able to be you in this space. Um, and so, um, so I think that's cool and something that we as a campus have been trying to work on. Um, I was going to say, um, uh, my son, um, who is now with UW Oshkosh, is, uh, he was, went through the whole Catholic education system. And for him, what he's discovered is other faiths. You know, I mean, this has always been 
in his face. You're going to Catholic school. This is how it is. And now suddenly he comes to UW Oshkosh and he's finding, he, uh, he was in the dorms and, and he's like, you know, you just, the room next to you, you could hear somebody praying. And, and, and he's like, it was so foreign to me. Um, so it's an opportunity for them to also experience other faiths and, and get in touch with other people and, 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 and maybe be sympathetic to those different things because they realize they're just a human being. You know, yes, they have, a, they're, they're praying to a different God, but they're, they're still just a human being or they're not praying to anybody at all. So it's an opportunity for them to kind of explore um, and, but hopefully walk away still with a faith base when it comes down to it or whatever makes them feel good about themselves, I guess, so. I think um, for some students that is what, that uh, part of being part of a religious student organization is their connection to campus and that shapes wholeheartedly their campus experience. It's what keeps them here um, and for that it's awesome. Um, I work in the College Union which is super cool because we get to go to speakers and do everything and consider it part of our job. But one of my favorite things is we have the concourse in Reeve, um, my last institution, it was a similar type where different groups can set up tables and sort of talk about their organization or events that they have coming. And so you can see the gamut of faith representation. You can see different student organizations. And there was one particular day in general in my last institution and right across from my office, there were four tables. And so four in a row, we had the um, local Jehovah's Witness Church um, the Walt Disney World College Program, the people that were pro-keeping the UND Native American logo, the people that were anti-keeping the UND Native American logo, all in a row. And I was like, all right, diversity of ideas, here we go. Um, and right about the point when it started to get a little heated between those four groups and their, you know, just kind of dialogue, and I'm not exaggerating, the marching band walks through. <laughs> um, and so, um, but I think it is that diversity of ideas and how do we, you know, how do we, celebrate the things and, and find that con and how do students find that connection and for many it is in their faith. And, and also learning how to ex exist with people that you don't agree with. Mm -hmm. um, at least even in my generation like we have been like so uh, like uh, sheltered from conflict and so now at this on when conflict hits like we don't always know how to respond to it and so I think that work of being able to share space even in, in places where you don't agree is actually is really, really valuable to us developing as human beings. And so that's, that's really cool. So what I'm hearing you say is that faith still matters. Because in a world that often it seems hokey, um, you're saying that students still see value in belief beyond what can be proven, yet for the most part. I would say, yeah, for the most part. I would also say that one of the most interesting things, I did a workshop this summer with, um, uh, we got a grant for faculty and staff who are really interested in building their religious literacy and building interfaith conversations in the classroom. Um, and one of the things that I thought was really interesting in that conversation was um, people of very, very strong faith, faith and uh, the atheists in the room um, felt simultaneously silenced. Um, and struggle to figure out how do we t how do we talk about that on on both sides. So I think I think I think faith really matters, but it matters in different ways and at different levels for different people. And one of the things that I think it, I, that is part of my work is is exactly what you're talking about, right? Is how do we live together in a space where we disagree and and not have to just completely silence that, right? So how can we say this is who I am and it's who I am to the very core of my being, and who you are might be really different from that. Um, and how can we articulate that and still figure out how to live together in community? That's, that's wonderful. All right, so I wanna, I just have one more question and then we can open it up for like 10 minutes, but um, how can we, as a community of people that really care, like how can we, officially, unofficially, whatever, how can we actually care better for our neighbors down the street, um, both, Students, faculty, staff, I mean, we, we can, I mean, we can absolutely pray on your behalf, but like what are some actual things um, or actual needs or anything? Is there anything that we can actually do? Or is this just kind of like we're learning and, and we can, next time we're driving through campus, we can slow down at the crosswalk, you know? Like what is the, that's, always good. that's a good one, that's a good one. So is there, I mean, practically, is there anything that we can do? Because we're here to learn and we're here to, like to grow and if there's anything like practically you're like actually this would be really helpful 
or, you know, sorry, there's this separation between the state and what the church can do together. And so, like, we just, we're just curious. I think one of the greatest examples, um, I mentioned that I moved here from the University of North Dakota, and um, the Lutheran Campus Center was right across the street from campus. And so I get a little different mission. Their target was audience was just students um, or the, the campus community. But um, they one of the, the coolest things about um, Pastor Chad and, and um, Kathy Fick, who was the, the reverend there, um, were that we would see them at campus events um, that weren't necessarily just faith. Um, based. So they were at diversity events. And so they not only walked the walk about inclusion, but or talked about inclusion, but they were there at some of those events. And um, and so students saw them. And I think that that makes a big difference. Um, in a very unique situation, that was th where the majority of our minority populations would say that was a safe space on campus, was that Lutheran Campus Center. Um, I think the, um, you know, it's, it's, Talking with students in the environment where they are, um, His House Campus um, Ministries on campus does an alternative break trip. Um, and some of the strongest connections they make with students are those students who just went on that alternative break trip because they wanted to do an alternative break trip. And His House does it in a, a very college-friendly budget. Um, and so I think, um, you know, getting to know the student population. I think it's events like these. I made a connection with um, Pastor David tonight. So now when I talk to students who may be looking for that connection, I can be like, hey, you know, I've had a good conversation um, with Pastor David and I know that they're looking to get connected and, you know, try to make connections. So I think anything that you can do to build those, we're a very connection-based population, you know, and so. Yeah. Um, you know, there's specific tangible things I could talk about too. I mean, these are these are resources you could follow up with any of us on later on, uh, or you know, uh, look up on your own. We have different things happening on campus. Like the Career Center on campus runs this amazing thing called the Career Closet, and and what that's for is it is incredibly expensive. We need to start buying professional clothes to interview for jobs. Right? And so they collect donations and they collect other, other things that people put together so that you can go there and get professional clothing uh, uh, for interviews. Uh, if you are interested in food insecurity, we are working that out on campus, whether it's the partnership we have with the Oshkosh Food Pantry or also our counseling center uh, also provides um, um, some resources to students as well. So there's individual things there. Um, but then, I mean, just to completely echo what Mickey, Missy was saying, um, you know, please reach out and build those connections. We have new faculty joining our campus every single year, and I would advise you to do what I do. I individually write each one of them a note, uh, welcoming them to campus, uh, because we're going to be working together now for a long time. They're going to be living together. Reach out and make those connections. Uh, these are new people who don't know anybody. They'll say they'll they'll take you up on the coffee, uh, you know, uh, you know, to form those relationships. Uh, it could, because. Um, I believe strongly that you should develop relationships just for relationships' sake because you don't know where it's going to go down the road. I want to echo something that Jennifer said from my personal experience. So after undergrad, I went straight to grad school because, you know, you don't want to go into the real world. You just keep going to college. Um, but um, I will say that the year after I finished my master's program um, and before I went back to school again, um, I... Um, will say that that was the one of the single hardest years for me socially because until you graduate from college you have always had a built-in cohort of friends um, and so even the people that you didn't like you knew people um, and the classmates that you had and that first year professionally I was like what, what, nobody wants to be my friend um, and so I again I echo what Art and Jennifer have said that's a population to you that I think um, could be hugely impactful because then you connect with them and they know your connections and they can help you connect with students so yeah I will echo all of these things but I'm gonna I'm gonna show my bias a little bit um, I, I think thinking about some of the social justice things that are happening around campus right so there are some of those direct care things right there are um, donating clothes is really important to that clothes closet and building those relationships with students but but also thinking from from a social justice perspective about things like um, I regularly have students of color talk about this being a really hard community to live in and to operate in. Um, and I think, you know, building our own racial literacy and thinking about racial justice in our community can make a big difference for the campus. I think um, paying attention to things like the fact that the buses stop at six and that makes it really hard for <laughs> campus people to get around, but it makes it hard for other people, right? The issues that we talked about with housing and landlords. So I think I think there are things that, yeah, they will, they will serve campus, but they also serve our community and paying attention to some of those systemic issues as well is really important. Wow. Okay. 
five minutes for all of your questions. I'm sorry, all right? They just kept, they were so good. Okay, so just really quick, is there any, anything that's just, you're really interested in or really curious about um, that we haven't covered so far? Yes. Um, I'm Jenna. I actually am a UW alum, and I work for Menasha Corporation in Nina in HR. So I have the unique opportunity to help onboard new grads and interns. And I'm wondering if you have any suggestions on how to help bridge that gap for new grads um, entering the workforce. Um, I find, don't assume that they have a, um, I, I, so I'm somebody that thinks out loud. Um, other people are more reflective and then, th and then say, um, but um, I don't assume that they always have the soft skills. And so I try not to, um, like I talk to new staff and things right away about what's the expected dress in our work environment? Um, what, what time do you need to be here? What time do you need to leave? And we, th we think that by the time somebody becomes a new professional that they should have those things. Um, but I, who trains them on those things? Mm -hmm. Who, you know, I talk about when we interview student employees, like who, who's supposed to tell you that wearing sweats to your interview is not, you know? Um, and so um, I think as much as possible, um, not assuming and helping them with those things. Um, but I think in terms of um, talking about connections to the community and, um, you know, do you provide a, a um, for new employees that are moving into the area, you know, a, a list of possible rental options and it, um, or a list of um, possible faith options, or um, a list of, you know, whatever, but some orientation to the area. Um, and then, uh, you know, assign a mentor if you can, um, or a buddy or somebody that can help them sort of navigate what's the unwritten culture of your organization, um, I think are all critical things. So, so this is a side question to that. Do, do you have a community mentoring pool that the university I mean, we do have alumni mentors for our Quest 3 program. So um, uh, if, you're, if you're not aware, our students do more than 244,000 hours of work in our community every year through the variety of different programs that we have. Um, and so we do have some alumni mentors who are connected with those particular courses. Okay. Um, so, so I would answer that question that way. Cool. I, I think we often tend to assign mentors internally. So like yeah. you're a new faculty member, here's the faculty mentor. You're you know, a new staff member, here's somebody else on campus for you. Um, but it is a unique kind of thing in terms of the community. Sure. So how do you use those people that go to your church that are already connected, or already work at UWO? Yeah. I would echo what Missy said about mentorship, but I would also think about are there places in the community where you can help people connect? So I, I've talked to students who are like, what, there's a Propel Oshkosh, there's a Young Professionals Organization? And, and they would never think to ask their employer, like, would you pay for me to go to that? Or would you, would you think of that as part of my work to go to this professional networking group? Um, I think as a new employee, you don't, you don't know that it's okay to ask for something like that. Um, but for some of the students, it w if it was offered and really encouraged, right, this is part of who you are as work, and if you want to go connect with these other organizations in the community, we'd love to support you being part of this young professionals group or something like that to help people get connected. next to the college because there's kids on their cell phone walking across the street, you know, not using the button that the city installed that flashes lights. I mean, that absolutely terrifies me, you know. I don't want to go to prison, <laughs> you know. And then uh, another item is that uh, I care deeply for those that are physically disabled. And Lisa, I think you do a great job with the campus. It looks fantastic. Love the vegetables and all that. but you can really tell where the campus ends. Like, yeah. as soon as that line ends, the sidewalks are terrible, the crosswalks are not access accessible for those with wheelchairs, you know. I don't know how we reach out, because unfortunately, we are surrounded by rental properties. So those, those students that are living in the rental properties don't feel the obligation to clean it, and the, the landlords themselves don't do it. Yeah, you're right, though. I've heard from a number of people, because I get a lot of, unfortunately, I don't get a lot of compliments. I get a lot of complaints regarding our snow removal. And, um, but yet, there's always those people who step up, well, 
I know exactly where our boundary lines are because I was slip sliding all the way to campus and then got to campus and I knew everything was fine. So, yeah. so it's always wonderful. But thank you for, for that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. One, yeah, this is it. And then we're sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Well, the mic is being passed, can I just can I just throw out the idea, like what a cool service project that would be for some group in the community, <laughs> right? I mean, to go out after some of these really big snowstorms and just like shovel, shovel <laughs> right? I mean, there are people who can't get out there and shovel, and I think um, I, I, uh, I, I work with somebody who um, her snowblower becomes a community snowblower because she lives with all the students, and they have an agreement that they know where Barb's snowblower is. The first student to go there gets to gets to do Barb's driveway because you do it first. But then Barb's snowblower gets to be used for about three blocks of student properties, <laughs> right? Uh, um, so I think I, you know that's just another thing when we're talking about little stuff that we can do. Those are the kinds of things that can make a difference. Um, we used to have a group that did a project called Drive by Raking. Um, I think you could drive by shovel too, where literally they would get, you know, a, two vans full of students and they would just drive around. And like, if they knew somebody, either their yard visibly needed to be raked or they knew it was an elderly couple or something like that, they would literally hop out and just like swarm the yard and rake it real quick and hop back in the car and keep driving. Um, and you know, there's a little, sometimes you need to introduce yourself to the people and that sort of thing. Um, we can talk about that, but I think doing, you know, you can make those sorts of projects fun, yeah. you know, for a group that to have a good time and do it and feel so rewarding. And if there's 20 people doing it, suddenly that it's light work. Yeah. All right, quick, Stacey. My question. Go. Well, it was just, it was about, you mentioned assault. Were you specifically speaking of sexual assault um, on, on people, how has that increased? What resources are available for those victims? Um, what are their needs that maybe the college can't meet that maybe we can, or at least try to? Um, you're right, I mean, not a quick answer. I'd be happy to chat with you more uh, afterwards. Um, it, is, it is a significant issue, you know. Uh, if you look at the statistics, uh, the numbers have only gone up. Uh, I don't think there's any of us that believe um, that that's because sexual assaults weren't occurring before. Uh, it's just that they're getting reported in greater uh, numbers now, which is good because we are hearing f uh, people uh, feel uh, uh, much more empowered to make those reports and, and, and much more trusting of systems uh, that we will care for them. Uh, we do put a substantive amount of energy um, and resources into caring for students and also on the prevention uh, effort. Um, you know, if you want to talk about true systemic work and the work that needs to happen, uh, you know, does higher education need to get a, an, an extreme critical eye in this? Absolutely they do. But if this education isn't happening in high school, it's already too late. Because I can tell you one of the most heartbreaking things uh, for me to work with is, you know, we have something now that all new students have to do this, you know, online training relating to Title IX to sexual and interpersonal violence. Now we can have a longer extensive conversation as to whether or not that online training actually does change behavior. But even if it does, you know, most of them get it done in their first, you know, couple months of school. We have things that happen the first weekend. You know, from the first time they are on campus before we've even had a chance to do anything. And so, Students are learning these behaviors from a, uh, a culture that does not even begin to understand what consent is, and they're not, and they're not being taught it from an early age. Uh, and then all of a sudden, we're expecting an online module that they're going to fill out in the first couple months of college is going to solve everything. So this is a systemic issue that needs to be taught from a young age and even before high school. Uh, and it is something that I, I and I, I do look at my kids as a case study for so many things of just little things that come home from why care and from school about how much more intentional they are about teaching kids now about asking for permission to hug before you just hug someone. Uh, all those little things of teaching through consent throughout life I think are absolutely crucial.